Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, today, um, now I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing in the last uh, three years for my PhD thesis, and the title is Music Recommender System, taking into account the artist's perspective. Uh, I was supervised by Xavier Serra, and this thesis was conducted in the Music Technology Group uh, of Universidad Pompeu Fabra. I wanted to start by thanking the members of the committee for being here today and for somehow uh, being part of my thesis. Um, I couldn't be more happy of having such a, a, a great committee that combines experience in uh, different areas of research and also different perspectives, uh, such as um, industry, acad academia, and even uh, policy making research. Um, I also wanted to um, acknowledge that um, this um, cacao, it was um, fun funded my uh, work. Uh, so this, this, this thesis was part of a collaboration between the MTG and Cacao. Um, so this is the overview for the talk of today. Sorry. Um, today, I, I wanted to start um, to give an introduction about the work I've been doing uh, and, and uh, the, the topic I chose, why I think this is an important problem. I will then um, talk about uh, the work we did um, interviewing artists and some um, art, some aspects that we identified from these interviews. Um, this this part of, of the thesis it's more related with the, the field of human computer interaction. And then I will move into other parts of the thesis that go deeper in some of the aspects that we identified in the in the interviews, such as gender imbalance in music recommendation or how algorithms may affect um, what people listen. So this other part, it's more related with the field of, of Rexis. And then I will move more uh, into the field of MIR and explain um, a data set that we created and uh, published and a method for um, representing music. And finally, I will uh, mention some of the, the, the conclusions and future perspectives. So um, I wanted to highlight here that um, I, I invested significant effort in um, learning and applying different methods and techniques from different disciplines. And I, I think this is uh, important when we are working with music recommendations, uh, since we need to understand and, and know how to um, extract minimal, meaningful information from, from the music, from the content, and also from the user's interactions. Um, and even more, if we are uh, working with a uh, topic of fairness, we are dealing with with um, with users and with people. We need to understand uh, if we are uh, trying to understand what um, what are their context, the problems, how how people interact between each other. So these are things that are more related, maybe with with social science, and therefore we need to uh, also need to to learn their um, techniques and and also to collaborate with uh, also um, other disciplines. Um, so now to start, I wanted to um, explain why I chose this, this topic or, or how I, I reached this, uh, this topic. So back in 2018, um, as you can see in this report, it was already clear that music, music, the music platforms were one of the main sources of music consumption. And during the years, we saw that this uh, every time increased more. So here we can see the, the number of uh, subs subscriptions of the platforms worldwide. Um, so here we can see that um, it increased every time more. And if we consider also non, uh, no, uh, not only the subscription, but also the, the active um, users, then we are talking about uh, uh, larger numbers. And if also we consider, for example, YouTube, then we are talking about billions of users that use these platforms to consume music every day. Um, so this is to show that the, the platforms uh, have an increasing power in what people consume and the recommender systems in, this, in these platforms play a, a fundamental role in, uh, in helping the users to decide what to listen. So these systems also have uh, an increasing uh, potential influence in what people listen. So with this um, increasing power, it comes a greater responsibility for us, for the designers of the system to make sure that there are not uh, any kind of undesired side effects or any kind of undesired bias. Um, also in the last years, we saw that the topic of fairness gained a lot of attention. Uh, here there are some books that, uh, that came out in the last years that I really like. Um, and this, uh, these books are um, for, um, analyze different cases of where uh, artificial intelligence may affect humans. Um, so this is to show that there is an increasing interest from the research 
a community, but also from the general public in the topic. Um, also wanted to mention that there is this uh, book by Oscar Selma. So um, even if now there is a lot of attention in the topic of fairness, uh, I wanted to mention that there, there was already back in 2009, 2010, already from this work, uh, we can see that um, the different algorithms may impact how um, users, the, the, the items that the users consume, uh, depending on, on the popularity of these items. So uh, this is to, to say that uh, somehow it's, it's, it's not a, um, a, new, a new perspective. Um, but if we look at the, the research in, in recommender systems, um, we see that typically they are um, user-centered. Um, we, we look at them from a, from a user perspective. We um, design these systems usually um, to maximize the user's satisfaction. And even now that there is a lot of work in the topic of fairness in recommender systems, if we look at the literature, most of, most of it focus also on the users. They try to make recommender systems more fair for the users. But if we um, zoom in into music recommender systems, and like I said, these are strong drivers of music consumption, and we want to make these systems more fair, um, then we need to consider also different groups of people that might get affected by the system, not only the users, but uh, for example, the artists. And um, I decided to focus on, on these groups, uh, on the artists, because uh, I saw that there were not uh, much um, research in the past in understanding how um, these, these recommenders can be more beneficial for the artist. So here that um, arise different questions such as um, how these systems can be more beneficial for the artists, how, um, what we can do uh, to, to make these platforms uh, better for the artists. So um, to show um, how some, some, of, some of these questions, I wanted to uh, put this example. Um, this is a, a, an example that I took from Spotify. So uh, this is a, a simple case of recommendation because it doesn't consider any kind of personalization. So if you go to an artist page, in this case, the Beatles, um, if you go to the Beatles profile, you, you have a section that, or any other artist, you have a section that it's titled fans also like that shows a group of artists. Uh, so I wanted to, to show this example to discuss or, or to kind of um, think about the different ways that we could design this, this recommendation and how these different decisions will affect different groups, groups of people. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask or, or what I wanted to, you to think about is what is the value that we are giving to the users when we, def we design a, a recommendation like this? Um, so um, I would say that for a user that, that knows the Beatles, more probable uh, will also know the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, and, and Elvis Presley. I mean, these are some of the most uh, well-known artists in the world. So uh, I guess here the goal with this recommendation is not to, to, to show something new to the user, not to discover something new, but um, somehow I understand that from the title that the goal is to give information to the user about uh, what artists share similar audience. So I guess it makes sense to think that people that listen to the Beatles also listen to, to Bob Dylan, for example. So now let's make the same question from the point of view of the artist. Uh, what, is, what is the value that we are giving to the artist when we show them in this recommendation? Um, and answering this question, I would say that for the Rolling Stones to be in this list, it's not going to change much. It's not that a lot of users will start to listen to the Rolling Stones or, or stop to listen to the Rolling Stones if they are in this list or not. But if instead we design a system that instead of putting the Rolling Stones here, it choose, let's say, a less popular band, let's say my, my neighbor's band that plays similar music to the Beatles, then um, that will have a huge impact for this band. From one day to the other, a lot of people will start to, to listen to this band and, and probably it will change a lot um, their audience. So this is to, to show that depending on the decisions that we make um, when we design this, we might affect different groups of people in different ways. Um, and since we are analyzing this list, I also wanted to uh, mention, for example, in terms of diversity, um, if you know the Beatles, uh, they played very different kinds of music. At the beginning, they played more popular music, then they went more for uh, Indian fusion and even experimental. So um, we don't see that diversity in this list. Here we see a quite homogeneous group of artists 
um, in terms, so homogeneous in terms of, of the music style that they play, and also in terms of the gender of the artist. So this is an all male uh, recommendation. So I wanted to uh, go, go a bit in deep into this aspect. So I look for another artist, in this case, Janis Joplin. So this is a female artist. And we, we get here similar, some similar artists to, to the previous recommendation. For example, there is Jimi Hendrix and there is The Doors. So um, from this, again, uh, we see that all these are artists are male artists. And from this, we can kind of um, suspect that maybe the, this, this genre, the, the classic rock, it's a, a male predominant genre. So um, I, I wanted to um, look further. So I looked to, for, in this case, for Madonna. And here we can see quite of uh, the opposite situation. Here we see that most of these recommendations are female artists, except for one. And this is to, um, to say that um, depending on how we define, how we decide to, to, um, to generate these recommendations, um, there is these questions of um, what what would be the right answer? How we can combine different female or, or males to give different um, proportions, but also different ethnicities, location, music styles, and and so on. So these are questions that are not easy to answer. There is no single answer to these questions, and these are the kind of questions that we need to face when we are designing uh, a recommender system. So. Uh, this is what I study in the first work I wanted to cover today. Um, sure. Yeah. So this was a collaboration I did with Christine, Christine Bauer from Utrecht. Uh, it was published in Interact Conference this year. It, the title of this paper was um, What is Fair? Exploring Artist's Perspective on Fairness of Music Recommender Systems. So um, in this study, which is um, we like what I was showing in the example, we wanted to understand what is the artist's perspective, what the artist would like that, um, how these systems uh, behave. So uh, we wanted to answer these questions, how the artists feel affected currently by streaming platforms, how they think, uh, and, and especially the recommender system, how they, they, they think that these platforms can be more beneficial for them in the future, and, and some even uh, concrete ideas or algorithmic decisions that uh, they would like to, to be adopted. So um, here there is like an overview of, of the steps we follow in, in, this, um, in this study. So this was a qualitative study. We uh, interviewed artists. Um, so first we have to make some decisions according to um, regarding the, the, um, the interviews. We decided to, to go for semi-structured interviews so we could um, allow the, the, the artists to go and explore different topics and raise different problems that maybe we, we didn't think about before. We, we define um, yeah, the questions we were going to ask and, and, and a lot of things. Then we had to prepare a lot of documents and like things they, they had to sign and, and so on. Uh, we selected a group of participants based on, on diversity in terms of country, age, uh, popularity, music style and gender. And gender. Um, we then conducted the interviews, recorded the interviews, and transcribed the recordings. We found saturation after nine interviews, which means that uh, at some point uh, we we saw that um, the we, we the topics were starting to repeat, and the the what the artists say was um, very similar. And, and so at that point, we decided to to stop doing interviews. So that's the saturation. And then we analyzed the. Um, the transcriptions using the, the method proposed by Myring, which is uh, named qualitative content analysis. So um, with this method, we could, um, first we had to, um, to annotate the different parts of the, of the transcriptions based on the topics that the artist um, we uh, identified and, and therefore we identified new, uh, every time new topics and we have to uh, go back to the other um, transcriptions to see if the other artists were also talking about these topics and so on. So this was the, the process of coding that it's kind of iterative. And after that, we could analyze the results. Um, so this, um, these annotations were very useful because uh, it helped us to organize the information. We could go topic by topic, um, uh, looking at the, what the different artists say, if they agree on a particular problem or, or a particular solution. So these are the topics that we identified. So the, uh, today I'm not going to cover all of them. I'm going to talk about four 
fragmented presentation, transparency, influencing user li li uh, listening behavior, and gender violence. So I'm going to start with a uh, fragmented presentation. Um, so uh, here we group different aspects that the artist express in, um, in the, saying that they don't appreciate the way they are presented in the platform. So for example, the, the first case I'm, I'm showing here, the artist says that when a user go to, uh, to their profile in the platform, uh, they will see at the top a few songs that according to this artist, these are the most popular songs of the band, but these are songs that they played, uh, they made 10 years ago. So he says um, that a user, uh, it has to invest significant effort, go, go scroll down to reach what they are, the, band, the band is playing now. And probably most of the users are not going to, to spend this effort. Most of the users will go to their profile, listen to a few these songs that are shown at the beginning and leave their profile uh, with the wrong idea or, or image of, of the band. Um, so the second um, aspect I wanted to highlight here, uh, in this case, the artist says that in the radio station that the, the platform generates for their band, he found another band that he rejects ideologically. So he says um, that this other band was used in the political campaign of a right-wing party, and their band, it's opposite in the political spectrum. So he says that this can harm the image of the band, because for them to communicate this message, it's, it's something that is very important. Um, so the, the artist asks, why does this happen? Why the band X appears in my, in my radio? So I'm going to go, come back to this question in, in a couple of slides, um, because this is uh, related with transparency that I'm going to cover later. But for now, I will move on. Um, so in, in here, to, to show this aspect here, I wanted to stop for a minute, because I wanted to make an analogy with a situation I, um, I had recently. So I'm going to read the quote first. It says, uh, the more information there is, the more meaningful get the experience. Instead of just listening to a rhythm, you listen to a song that wants to communicate something in a certain context. So um, I wanted to share this experience that I had. So some, some months ago, I was, in, I was visiting the Museum of Joan Miró here in Barcelona. And um, I, when I entered, I saw this painting um, and um, I didn't have enough time to cover all the museum because it, it's, I had like one hour to, to close. So um, when, I, when I saw this painting, I, I was quite intrigued about, uh, about it. I couldn't understand, I'm not uh, very uh, knowledgeable about this, so I, I couldn't understand what the artist was trying to communicate, but still um, I had to decide if, if I wanted to spend more time in this painting and maybe um, like not covering other other parts of the museum, or or if I yeah, or if I wanted to um, to just move on. Uh, so for you to understand, this is basically a, um, a four meters by two meters painting. It's basically a, a white canvas with a single dot. It's titled landscape, and it's from 1968. So I I was quite curious, so I decided to to spend a bit more time in this painting. And, um, and I Googled it and I found this quote by the artist. So it says, silence is a denial of noise, but the smallest noise in the midst of silence becomes enormous. So after reading this, I could understand that um, what the artist was saying is that um, there is uh, in, in all this silence or in all this white canvas, even this uh, smallest, smallest noise, this, this uh, single dot is somehow, um, it becomes enormous, somehow gets all the attention. So if instead of uh, putting a single element here, the artist decided to put more elements, more dots or, or items, um, then this attention will be distributed to, to the different items. So at the end, um, when, I, when I left the museum, at the end, I couldn't cover all the different parts, but I, had a, um, I felt that I had a very good experience in the museum because um, I, I, I felt that I learned something new, um, this message, it, it made me reflect, it made me uh, think about it. So uh, I was quite happy. So um, this reminds me, uh, this remind me very well to what this artist was saying. So here, the artist was saying that according to him, there are different kinds of music. Some music um, required some, some, some context, some information to be understood and to be appreciated by the listener. 
Um, so he says um, the listener has to put maybe more effort in, in go over this information to, um, to understand the, the, the message that the artist is, is kind of communicating. But he says that with this more effort also comes uh, a higher reward for the listener. He says the listener is going to be more, more satisfied, let's say, if it's able to, to, to appreciate and to understand this art, the artist's um, message. And um, he says that in the platforms nowadays, there is not um, this context, there is not this information in most of the cases. And um, he also says that there is other kind of music that don't require this information. There is other kind of music we just listen to it and we enjoy it. Um, and it's music that we can use for, for dancing or, or it makes us happy. So this, according to him, it's music that it's for, for pure entertainment, let's say. So uh, my reflection from this quote is that um, if we are uh, building algorithms and, and recommender systems that are um, based on the user's interactions, but in the platform, there is not enough information to uh, appreciate some, some particular kind of context, then at the end, we will be optimizing this, these algorithms to only recommend a particular kind of, of, um, of items, only a section of the catalog. So this will kind of bias the recommendations to only some kind of music that it's mostly for, for entertainment. So I think this is something we should pay more attention and, and be aware of. Um, now, moving on to the next topic, there is uh, the topic of transparency. Um, like, I, if you remember, I was mentioning an artist was asking, why does this happen? So that's clearly um, re related with transparency. He was asking why uh, I see this other band that I rejected ideologically in my, in my radio. So he was asking because in that way, uh, if he can understand what, what was going on, he could take some action to change the, the system's behavior, or he can understand that he can he's not communicating his message very well to, to the listeners, or, um, or, or there is just uh, some issue in the platform, there is nothing that he can do. So um, this, this is kind of also part of transparency. But the point um, I'm going to, uh, that I'm showing here is it's a bit different here, it says that um, although humans and algorithms may be biased, a non-ideal decision made by a human may be easier to accept than one taken by an algorithm. So here, um, this is to show that uh, transparency is also related with the perception of fairness that the artist may have of the platform. So it's not enough that the platform is fair with the artist, but also it has communicated in a, in a way that the, the artist perceive it uh, fair. Um, then next topic, it's about influencing user listening behavior. And here um, we found a strong agreement. So we wanted to understand what was the, uh, what the artists think about the, the power and possibility of the platforms or of influencing um, some kind of um, the, what the user listen to, to try to balance in a way um, what, what they listen. So uh, they are the, we found a strong agreement between the artists against this idea. They don't like the idea that the, the platforms influence users listening um, taste. So uh, the quote says, I don't see why we should tell the users which genres they should listen to. However, um, we found um, here uh, an exception when, when in what relates to, to gender. So here, all the artists agree that the platform should promote con more content by female artists to reach gender balance in what users consume. So this is, uh, and, and we found that uh, recommender systems can, can be used uh, in order to do this. So this is somehow an exception to what I, I was just uh, saying. So the quote, the first quote says, I think there should be actions to correct some kind of biases. The, qu the question is in which cases should be corrected and which not. In heavy metal music, I imagine there are not many female singers. Maybe we could give them more visibility, otherwise they would never be seen. And the second quote says the population of the world is 50% women, so it would be ridiculous if the system wouldn't recommend them. Um, so uh, there are, to, to conclude, there are um, different aspects that in which we, we found a strong agreement between the artists, uh, where if, um, uh, if the platforms uh, address this aspect, we believe that the, the systems will be more beneficial and more fair with the, art, with the artists that we interviewed. So the next part I wanted to cover, um, it was also part of a collaboration with Christine, Christine Bauer, and it was published in, in Cheer. 
The title was uh, Break, the, Break the Loop Gender Imbalance in Music Recommenders. So um, this, this part of the work, it's, um, uh, this study is divided into, we, we apply two different approaches. So the first approach, it's, it's a qualitative approach, uh, which is basically what, what I was explaining before. Uh, it's based on the interviews and here um, we focus on the topic of gender balance. Uh, and like I said, we found a strong agreement between the artists that platforms should promote more content of female artists to promote um, this, to, to reach the gender balance in what users consume. Then the second part of this work, um, in, there we apply a quantitative approach uh, for which we take two different data sets of user listening behavior. We train a collaborative filtering method um, model and we analyze the recommendations of this model according to the artist's gender. Um, we then um, also analyze what, uh, with a simulation, what would be the effect if users consume what the system recommends. So what would be the effect in the long term? Before um, showing the results, I wanted to mention that all the code and data, it's available online for reproducibility. Um, so um, first of all, we found that there, there is um, a bias in, in, the, in the data set that we were using. Uh, more or less one out of four of the listening events correspond to female artists and the other three correspond to, to male artists. And we found that um, our collaborative filtering method was somehow reproducing this bias. Uh, the distribution was more or less 25% for female artists and the other 75% of the recommendations were for male artists. Then if we look at the, the rankings, we can see that the first recommendation of a female artist comes on average in the position six to eight, while the first uh, recommendation of a male artist comes in the, in the first position. So this shows that there is um, a different exposure that the recommender is giving to, to the two groups of, of artists, giving less exposure to the female artists. And um, as you know, the, the ranking is important because um, by positioning one of these groups um, higher in the ranking, it means that um, there is more probability that users will listen to this element. So somehow um, it's giving more, more chances to, to a group to be listened than another. Um, also important to, to highlight that we, we found uh, a very different um, performance of the system um, be, uh, for female artists and for male artists. So um, we found that for all the accuracy metrics that we measured, the, the female artists get a lower accuracy compared to male artists. And this can be considered a case of discrimination according to, to some literature. Um, now I'm going to explain how the simulation works. So for a simulation, we basically take a data set um, of, of these uh, user interactions. We train our model and for each user, we generate a recommendation and we select some of these um, recommended items and we incorporate these to our original data. So after that, we retrain our model and we generate new recommendations for the user. So um, this is an iterative process that we repeat multiple times. Here we are simulating the, the real situation in which uh, maybe a platform have uh, systems that recommend items to the users. So the users consume these recommendations during day and during night, the, the platform can retrain their models with the new interactions. So um, these are the results uh, of the simulation. Before explaining the results, I need to, to, to explain what this lambda parameter means. Um, so we use this lambda parameter to penalize the recommendations of male artists. So the, the higher the lambda, the, uh, the higher the penalization of, of male artists recommendations. So a lambda parameter of zero means that we are not doing any kind of intervention. We are just recommending the elements how, how are produced by the recommender. So as you can see here with the, with the green line, if we measure the, the difference between the average um, first position of female artists uh, minus the, the average first position of male artists, we see that the difference is it's minus six, which is um, what I was showing before in the table. This means that if we don't do anything, there is no, no intervention, then, then this, this difference in exposure stays stable during time. It doesn't get worse or better. Um, but here with the, the lambda value of five and seven, which are the, the red and yellow line, you can see that slowly we get closer 
to zero, which will mean that we are giving similar exposure to both uh, female and male artists. Um, I think the, the main takeaway message from, from this work is to uh, is that we, we, we found this feedback loop. We found that um, since the users are listening to, to, to less female artists, the algorithm is recommending to less female artists. And since the algorithm is recommending to less female artists, the users are listening to less female artists. So this is the feedback loop that we need to break if we want to change um, how the, the system uh, generates the recommendation. And what we can see from this simulation is that it's possible to break uh, I'm not showing it here, but if we measure how many interventions we have to do, you can see that at the beginning we have to do some intervention, but then at some point the algorithm starts to recommend more balanced results more, more naturally, let's say. Um, so now the next topic I wanted to cover is um, this um, algorithmic influence in session-based recommendation. So this was done in collaboration with Didma Yanak, who was presented in Brexit 2020. And the title of the paper is Explain Longitudinal Effects of Session Based Recommendation. So, um, like I said, from what we found from the interviews, is that um, the artists agree that we shouldn't influence what users listen. So, uh, this is uh, related with what we, we study in this, in this part. Um, so, um, session based recommenders, it's a particular kind of, of recommender systems which, where we have few um, interventions or, or interactions of the user, and we, and we need to generate recommendations based on these few uh, interactions. So basically we have uh, the user that listened a couple of songs and we need to uh, generate recommendations that fit well to this session. Um, so we hypothesize that uh, this kind of algorithms may have a stronger influence in what people uh, consume because um, since they are based on very few interactions, it, there is more probability that they will start to recommend similar things to the different sessions, and therefore um, influencing more what, what people consume into, towards these this similar elements. So um, this is what we study here uh, with a similar simulation approach to the one I just explained. The only difference is that instead of talking about um, users, here we are, we are dealing with sessions. Um, so um, very quickly, I'm going to mention some of the results. So um, we analyzed four different algorithms for session-based recommendation using two different data sets. And in all cases, uh, we could see that every time that we retrain our models, we were uh, reducing the coverage, which means that every time more, we were, um, the, the systems were recommending less um, different, less, less number of, of elements. And also, at the same time, uh, recommending every time more, uh, more popular uh, items. So basically, the, the systems were skewing the distribution of the recommendation to a particular kind of items that are more popular. So I'm not going to, to explain um, this now, but also wanted to mention that we propose a re-ranking strategy that helps to, to deal with this problem and, and doesn't affect the accuracy of the systems. Um, all the code and data, again, it's available online for reproducibility. Um, now, um, I wanted to cover this, this part of the thesis, where, uh, which is also a collaboration I did in this case with Sergio Ramas and Massimo Cuadrana. Uh, we presented in this workshop in Rexis. The title is Maximizing the Engagement, Exploring New Signals of Implicit Feedback in Music Recommendation. So here we, um, we were interested in uh, capturing how engaged the, the users are with the artist. So we say that if we are able to generate recommendations that maximize this, this engagement, it will be beneficial for both users and artists because, uh, well, it's clear that for users is something good because they will, be, uh, they will enjoy what we are recommending. And also it's good for the artist because um, these users that uh, we, we generate the recommendation will go to their shows, will buy their merchandising, will be more, more fans, they will listen their new songs and, and so on. So um, we noticed that we typically use the, the play counts when we want to make recommendations. So uh, the play count is how many times the user listen to the artist, but there are other kinds of signals that we can use. For example, we can look at the number of days that the user listened to an artist, the number of different songs of the artist that the user listened, and um, how many times per day the user listens to the artist. 
So here we put a name to all of these. First, uh, we call these the, the raw signals. We, uh, we say that track counts is the, the number of different tracks the user listened to the artist. Day counts is the number of days that the user listened to an artist. Play counts is how many times a user listened to an artist. And binary, um, it's a value of one only if the user ever listened to the artist. We then propose these composite signals. Uh, the first one we call it engagement and combines the play counts and the day counts. So um, basically for each day that the user listens to the artist, we count how many times that day the user listens to the artist and we multiply it by the logarithm of the day. So here we are using the logarithm because we want to, um, we are more interested in distinguishing if the user listens to this artist for one, 10 or 100 days and not that much if it's a difference of 10 days or 11 days. So we are more interested in, in that scale. Um, the second signal we propose is uh, called fidelity, which combines engagement and track counts, uh, doing uh, an average uh, weighted average uh, with the alpha parameter. So this is how we evaluate this, um, this, uh, this, these methods. Um, we use four different data sets and we train uh, a different uh, matrix factorization model using each of the signals that I just mentioned. And we then um, evaluate using two sets of metrics. So, um, so the first uh, set of metrics, we call it the listener centric. These are the typical accuracy metrics that you, we use in, in Rexis. The second set of metrics, um, we call it the artist centric. And these are, for example, for the test set, we measure how many times the user listened to the artist, how many tracks the user listens to the artist, and how many days the user listens uh, to that artist. We also measure the coverage, which tells us how many different artists the system is recommending. Uh, these are the four different data sets that we use. As you can see, they have very different uh, time, number of users, artists, and uh, also different like, densities. Again, all the code and data, it's available online. Um, and now going to the results, you can see that uh, for the listener-centric evaluation, uh, we don't have uh, a single input that keeps the best performance. So uh, for each of the data sets, we get the best performance with a different input. But for the artist-centric evaluation, we see that um, using our input, um, our engagement signal, we, we get more consistent results. We get that uh, best performance for uh, most of the data sets and most of the metrics. So these are um, promising results that suggest that the, the engagement metric can be useful for, for recommending um, items, but we require more, more uh, experiments with, with real users and, and, and for longer period of time to, to see uh, what, what um, effect may have this with, uh, in a real situation. Um, now, I wanted to cover the Melon playlist data set. This was also published in this case in two different papers, uh, the first one in ICASP and the second one in EUSIPCO. Uh, this was done in a collaboration with Cacao, like I said. So, as you know, uh, one of um, the main limitations we have in, in, in MIR and, and, and signal processing is the lack of a large uh, audio data set because of the, the copyright um, commercial music. And uh, here we try to address this issue. We um, compare. So basically what we, we wanted to, to understand is if we can reduce the information that we have that we use in the, in the, in the audio representations, um, then uh, this will um, would be a, a good way of, of uh, going around these this copyright um, restrictions because we could be able to, uh, when we reconstruct the audio, the original audio, we can see that the, the performance doesn't, doesn't get affected and, and we can see that the, the audio gets, um, uh, it's, it's degraded. So that, that's a good way of going around this restriction. So we compare uh, state-of-the-art architectures for um, audio-based audio um, automatic tagging, and we use the two different data sets. So um, we saw that, um, I'm not going to cover these results, but I'm going to mention that using 48 Melvins, we could see uh, a good trade-off by the amount of information that we, um, 
that we uh, reduce and the performance of the systems. Again, here the, the code is available online and you can find here some examples that uh, when we reconstruct the audio, how, um, how this information gets um, um, lost, let's say. So based on this conclusion, we decided to, to publish the Melon Playlist dataset. Uh, like I said, Melon is a streaming service popular in Korea. Um, it's uh, owned by Kakao. And uh, we decided to select 150,000 playlists, which is what uh, we used to, to create the dataset. And we released 650,000 tracks um, that are related with this playlist. Here, there are some statistics of the data set. You can see that um, the, the playlists have less than 200 songs, more or less 10 tags, and more or less 10 different genres. Um, it's important also to mention that uh, most of uh, the songs that we, we publish are mostly new songs. After 90% are songs after the year 2000. Um, this data set offers multiple applications such as sequential recommendation, music classification, automatic tying, automatic playlist continuation, and also enables new methods that can be applied such as deep metric learning, which it's uh, what I'm going to explain in the next section, representation learning and semi-supervised learning. Um, so this is the, the last part I wanted to cover. Uh, this was done also in a collaboration in this case with uh, Xavier Favori, Dimitri Bogdanov, Costas Trossos, and, and Xavier Serra. It was published in IEEE Signal Processing Letters, and the title of the paper is Rich Music Representation with Multiple Cross-Modal Contrastive Learning. So um, we wanted, uh, with this method, we wanted a way to combine different types of data. Like, um, like I said, we are using, in this case, the, the Melon Playlist data set. So we have, for example, audio representations, tags, and playlist song interactions. Um, so we wanted to find a representation of the song that somehow combines the relevant information from these uh, different types of data or so different types of modalities. We say that this method is more aligned with what they, the, the artist expressed in the, in the interviews. For example, um, it allows us to incorporate uh, the context of the music um, as, as it was um, meant. Uh, then it also allows to, to incorporate or to recommend new and less popular music, which is another thing that we found in the interviews, but I didn't mention today. So contrastive learning, um, it's one of the most uh, common ways of, um, um, of, of, or of metric learning nowadays, but, um, and, and triplet loss is, is maybe the, the most common way of, of applying contrastive learning. For triplet loss, we need to define uh, examples that we give to the model so that um, when uh, this, this, these examples are composed by triplets, which are an anchor, a positive and a negative example. Um, but, when, when we want to, to create these triplets, we need a, a strategy. And depending on this strategy, uh, if will depend if the model learns something useful or not. If these triplets are too, net, too difficult to understand for the model or to distinguish from the model, then there's uh, nothing that model will learn. If they are too easy, the model is not going to learn anything. So um, this, requires, uh, this strategy requires um, a lot of experimentation to find the right strategy. And this is one of the, the main issues with this method. Uh, but there are other loss functions that can be used, like uh, NTXNT, which is what we use in our method. In these in this, uh, losses, we don't need to, to define the triplets in advance, since they, the positive and the negative examples can be identified from the mini batch of data that we give to the model. So now I'm going to explain how our model works. Um, using two, two modalities, and later I'm going to explain for three, modali three modalities. Uh, so let's say for a given song, we have the, the audio representation and the, and the tags. So our architecture has an audio encoder and a tag encoder. So uh, we give the, the audio representation to the audio encoder and we obtain a representation in this latent space. And we give the tags to the tag encoder and we obtain a representation in the same latent space. So with contrastive learning, we will try to minimize the distance between these two representations that correspond to the same track. Um, to put it, put it more formal, here there is the loss function that we use 
as you can see in the nominator, what we are doing is to push closer this C alpha and Psi beta, which are the, the two representations that come from the two modalities for the same song I. And in the denominator, we are pushing further all the other representations that we have in our mini batch. Um, now, if we add uh, another modality, in this case, a collaborative filtering vector, what we do is that we compute the pairwise losses between the three representations that correspond to the same song, and we try to minimize the sum of these losses. Um, now, uh, I'm going to, to explain how we evaluated this method. So for the evaluation, we use three different tasks, automatic, um, sorry, audio classification, automatic tying, and automatic playlist continuation. Um, again, all the code, it's available online. So for the task of uh, general classification, you can see that we get the best performance with our method um, trained only with genre, um, getting also a similar performance to um, other architectures and trained with different data sets. For the second task of automatic tying, we also get the best performance uh, using the, the model uh, trained only with genre um, for some tasks, sorry, for some tags, and for other tags, we get the best performance with uh, the model trained with collaborative filtering and general. And finally, for the task of automatic playlist continuation, we get the best performance with the, the model trained with collaborative filtering and general. Um, I, I made a, a demo to show this um, how this um, method works and to show you the, um, the representations, but I'm, I'm not going to show it today because I um, I don't have enough time, but it's available online and you can you can try it out. Uh, now I will go to, to the final section. Uh, first of all, um, uh, to mention the main contributions. So like I said, for the first time, we um, interviewed artists and we tried to understand how they are affected by current streaming platforms and the recommender systems. We apply a qualitative approach and we identified specific aspects in which um, the, the platforms can be more beneficial for the artist. So then we went deeper in some of these aspects, um, such as the case of uh, gender imbalance, where we applied mixed method and we proposed a solution. Um, we then proposed uh, a novel metric to capture the engagement of users with, art with artists. We also study longitudinal effects of session-based recommenders and propose a solution to mitigate such effects. Um, we publish a large scale data set that con contains content and collaborative information, which enables multimodal approaches. And finally, we propose a method um, based on contrastive learning that enrich track representations and reach the state of the art in multiple tasks. As future work, um, I wanted to mention a few lines of, of uh, research that open this, this thesis, but uh, this can be applied from, from different perspectives, from uh, lawmaking or, or policymaking, uh, industry and academia, and even collaboration between the, these different perspectives. So for example, um, I think we need to involve more the artists and, and even to validate our results with a larger population of artists. Also, there is more work to uh, reach gender balance in platforms, for example, in different metrics that we uh, could use, <clears throat> and, and intersectionality between different um, the, the, the different identities. Um, also, consider non-binary genders that we didn't consider in our work. Um, there is more from the uh, human-computer interaction, more work to be done to uh, know how to present the information to the users. So that puts the, the music into context that, as it was meant by, by the artist and how to give more control to the artist over what gets recommended. And finally, um, also how to make decision-making systems more transparent to users and artists. Um, here, there is a list of all the publications I did in the last three years for the PhD. I also wanted to mention that we made two articles uh, related um, to covering the, the work we did in, in terms of gender balance of, of the recommendations. These articles were for um, general public. And after we published them, we saw that this happened. Um, uh, we got a lot of attention. A lot of uh, people uh, contacted us to, to interview us uh, for radio shows, TV shows, and, and newspapers. A lot of articles were written in, in many different languages in different countries. Um, this is to, to show that um, there is 
this is first of all to, to mention that this is part of the dissemination of my work and also to show that uh, this topic um, it's also um, uh, it's getting also a lot of attention from from the general public um, like I mentioned all the software that I build it's it's open source it's available online um, the data sets uh, that I use in this case the, the melon I already covered it and there is also a data set with gender annotations of the artist for the last fm 360k and last fm 1 billion data sets and to finish um i wanted to to finish with with this image um so this is um the when i was starting the phd back in 2018 how the music technology group used to look like and here there is a more updated picture of uh well actually from last year but to, to show how uh, this thesis was conducted, mostly from home. Um, and with that, I wanted to finish and um, I would be happy to answer your questions. <laughs>